Good day to you. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you about my fascination with small polyhedral globes and the mesmerizing simulations that we can run under digital models. Even though since the Renaissance the idea of a round planet Earth has been established and widely accepted, at least among those who do not believe in conspiracy theories, our mental picture of the good old blue and round planet Earth is much more recent, mostly thanks to the space race between the Soviet cosmonauts American astronauts and their corresponding space agencies. These are mementos to help us realize that our notion of scale and the intuitive meaning of the words such as small and big are relative and dependent on our own size, the depth of our vista, and the speed with which we can travel. We can imagine the excitement for the whole humanity after getting the first good look at the blue marble from the space. Among the many cool things that got inspired by this new cosmic vantage point, was a unique counterculture magazine published between 1968 and 1972 called The Whole Earth Catalog, featuring essays, book reviews, and articles on self-sufficiency, ecology, alternative education, do-it-yourself projects, and holism. On the first pages of the first issue of this magazine, we can read, the insights of Buckminster Fuller are what initiated this catalog. The American magazine Life in May 1943 featured the Dimaction Globe of Buckminster Fuller as a tool for political geographers. Reading the magazine article in the picture, the President of the United States keeps a 50 inches diameter globe close enough to his desk so that he need only swing his chair to consult it. As a political geographer, the President knows that no standard flat map can give him all information he requires. The student and master of political geography is interested in the true relative geographical locations of the great powers and in strategy of communications on the great circle or the shortest path routes between them. Richard Buckminster Fuller designed his Dimaxian world map to fit exactly these requirements. Archetypical complex systems, such as a Rube Goldberg chain reaction machine, also known as a Goldberg machine, have a typical characteristic. A model chain reactions involving feedback loops. One thing leads to another, and that leads to one other thing, which in turn leads to another one, etc., 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 and so on and so forth. Complicated things or situations, on the other hand, are typically those that perplex human mind because of baffling human conditions. It must be obvious from the context of this talk that we are talking about complex things rather than complicated things. In collaboration with the Y Factory Design Research Group at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment of TU Delft, we designed the course Planet Maker in two rounds between the years 2017 and 2019. The first time for simulating what if scenarios and envisioning future globes, and the second round for making digital simulation games. In the remainder of this talk, I will present some totally fictitious simulation models that we made for two reasons. Number one, raising awareness on the complexity of the fate of the dear old planet Earth, and number two, teaching the students some essential methods and techniques from generative sciences for simulating complex geospatial systems. It would probably be irrational to try to teach how to simulate any phenomenon at the scope of the whole planet Earth for making predictions in an architecture studio. Nevertheless, we were determined to make our simulation game models for two reasons other than making predictions. Number one, to educate ourselves and the public by gaining insights on how spatial complexity emerges out of relatively simple interactions, and number two, to enjoy from oversimplifying such complexity. After all, we did not want to make any predictions, nor did we have any delusion of crystal ball models. As George Box, a British statistician, beautifully said about all kinds of box models, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. My additional one cent on the subject is that the usefulness of the models relates to the clarity with which they can explain the mechanisms underlying change. If nothing changed around us, we would not bother making models of any sort whatsoever. We essentially build models to understand change, not only to predict change because we might be afraid of surprises, but also because we want to really understand how things change and why should that be helpful or necessary, if we can predict change that is. Because by understanding the way things change, we can manage them, tweak them, or nudge the agents responsible for change to steer towards desirable outcomes. As we consulted Maurice Escher and Rube Goldberg in a single room in 1968 on how to make such simulation games or models, we would have probably gotten their quotes on why 
a polyhedral globe is the best platform for making such archetypical complex systems. The idea of such chain reactions is an excellent manifestation of network connections and feedback mechanisms bringing about complexity. The gist of the course Future Models in the Planet Maker Studios was to combine complex space networks models on polyhedral globes and complex process networks in physical board games and digital simulation games. In a short presentation, I cannot possibly bore you with the gory details of how we actually made the simulation models, but I can at least give you some hints and an example. We use cellular automata, agent-based models, gravity models, and Markov chains in particular to simulate diverse phenomena related to climate change, agriculture, migrations, trade flows, and their effect on the planetary landscape. In other words, the common denominator of all models was the changes made on the landscape technically called the finite colored land use labels of the triangular cells of the polyhedral globe. Computers are getting faster and faster each year, but computation in its modern form is inherently digital. This means that we can only work with discrete and finite elements because the idea is to do a finite number of calculations using algorithms. The first and the simplest way to discretize the globe would be to think of a cubic earth. These are the only five polyhedrons that are perfectly regular for tiling a spherical surface into exactly equal polygonal facets, providing the most regular tessellations of a spherical globe. Out of these five unique polyhedral tessellations, as you can imagine, the one with the most number of facets, that is the icosahedron with 20 facets, is the obvious winner for two reasons. Number one, because it can provide the largest base map with the most number of regular facets, and two, that it will provide a base map only consisting of simple triangles, which are the simplest and thus the best elements for making simulation models. But first, we have to scale up these models to provide enough resolution for the simulation models. However, when talking about scale, we are not talking about their sizes, as you see in this picture, but their number of elements. As I said, the icosahedron, or the 20-faceted polyhedron, is the largest possible regular partitioning of the sphere. However, simulating the fate of the planet at the resolution of 20 locations and their dynamics would be rather coarse and uninteresting. So we decided to go a few steps further by subdividing these triangles into more equilateral triangles. Remember the Dimaxion of Buckminster Fuller? It looked a lot like these globes, but it actually was different both in its tessellation and in the projection of the planet Earth to the polyhedral facets. We decided to be somewhat more meticulous and go all in for the North Pole and the South Pole to be exactly at the apexes of the icosahedron. Here is a simple picture showing how all distances on these globes are computed as geodesics or walks around the globe on triangular tiles. If something is far away from you, then you are less likely to visit it or interact with it in any way. This could be the curse of geography, which is better known as the first law of geography, formulated by the famous American geographer Waldo Tobler. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. We are so accustomed to the idea of measuring distance with meter sticks or yard sticks that we might forget about the most universal measure of distance, time. If you can get somewhere faster than somewhere else, practically you are closer to that space. The same effect that railways have had in shrinking the size of Europe in time, a hypothetical hyperloop network can have on the whole planet Earth. So far, I've been referring to the idea of small world networks implicitly, but now I'm referring to the main concept literally, a small world in which you can get to know anybody just by making a few new friends. The late British mathematician John Conway invented this relatively simple game of life in the year 1970, which has had profound effects on the complexity theories of cities and landscapes, for example, in making land use transport interaction models. Quoting from goodreads.com, Micromotives and macro behavior was originally published over 25 years ago, yet the stories it tells feel just as fresh today. And the subject of these stories, how small and seemingly meaningless decisions and actions by individuals often lead to significant unintended consequences for a large group is more important than ever. Here is an exemplary cellular automata model from Planet Maker 1 simulating the economical dynamics brought about by local trades as a finite state machine whose cells are small triangles on an unrolled icosahedral map. Here you can see a screenshot of a simulation game prototype on renewable energy production and its effects on land use from the Planet Maker 1 studio. 
And here you can watch a short trailer of the planetary simulation games made by the students of the Planet Maker 2 studio. What if we could simulate our planet? How can you lead the world to a better tomorrow with the decisions you make today? Planet Maker 2 allows you to test your policy decisions and see them change the future of our planet. You can distribute the wealth, open or close borders, make everyone a vegan, green the deserts or develop a hyperloop network. Planet Maker provides you with a platform to test out unlimited future scenarios. Seeing both sides of the planet allows you to see the whole world status at all times. Planet Maker includes an equally powerful urban visualisation tool so that you can not only see your decisions impact the global scale, but also define the urban. Planet Maker 2 represents a revolutionary way to simulate our planet's future, where we have to maximise our ecocentric thinking while maintaining our egocentric way of living. Let us talk sometime later if you are interested in designing time machines or crystal balls for travelling back and forth to the past and the future of our planet. Herewith I would like to thank all of these students and my colleagues at the Vi Factory and Design Informatics Research Groups for an enjoyable collaboration. As much as I wanted to get into the gory details of the simulation models, I kept a promise to keep this presentation short and simple. And so, here I leave some references for those who might be interested to read more on how complex these theories can help make the next generation simulation models for understanding the dynamics of future landscapes. Have a great day on Earth.